was it. And maybe that statement, most of all, is what's most important about him. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Adam Kokesh. myself at this point, <laughs> but I, I, would, I would like to point out that, that for all the insanity of, of the drug war, if you, if you happen to find yourself in jail in D.C. with five dollars worth of stamps, you can get, I mean, hypothetically, within, you know, a matter of hours, pretty much any drug you might want to consume. I'm not saying that this theory has been tested, but I'm pretty positive in, in asserting that yes, five dollars worth of stamps in DC jail will get you whatever you could possibly want. And as you all know, I was, I was released actually a few months ago and I've been laying low until just recently, until really, this is my first chance to, to really speak freely since being out of jail. And I've been writing a book, and I'm, I'm really excited about this. So I've been, I've been using the time well. And, you know, one of the things I just found out from my parole officer yesterday is that I'm, I'm actually still banned in D.C. for two years. Damn. It's okay. I already threw the ring in the fire. I don't need to go back anymore. And uh, Mortar on the Potomac will be just fine without me. But I was excited yesterday to know that I will be able to continue my plans to relaunch Adam versus the Man. We're going to be coming back better and stronger and better organized. And it hurts me to say this, but you know, my, my production really only was about half of what it should have been for the poor organization and inconsistent production values. We're going to be addressing all that. And uh, I know you all enjoy the cold status paradise you have up here in New York, but we're going to be relocating to Los Angeles. I hear there are some statists out there, so we should be having fun with it. And I, and I'm, I think the government's about to fall off into the ocean, so I, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned about that. But um, my government-induced, taxpayer-funded spiritual retreat was really an enlightening experience. <laughs> And for all of you who helped pay for it, thank you very much. <laughs> but, um, you know, plenty of time to work out and, and to meditate. And I, I, re I really did learn a lot. And when you see the justice system from the inside, you know, you feel a different kind of pain of statism. And I think there are a lot of people who are made victims of government. And as a bully, government is very good at making people feel like they're guilty. And I think one of the most powerful things that our movement has to offer in terms of people who are coming out 
and, and are sharing these stories. And, and, and what we see now, just made possible by the way we're connected on the internet, is to know that we're not alone as victims of the state, as bullies. I mean, how many people here have been to jail? And how many people would raise your hand to that question in any other room? <laughs> okay, thank you, Anthony. Anthony would, yeah. <laughs> Proudly. <laughs> but it's, it's a really incredible tipping point that we're coming to. As people realize that, that we're not alone in this. That we're all victims of the state. And when we get to that critical mass of people who go, wow, we're, 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 we're done being the victimizers here. And everybody in this room, I'm sure, is familiar with the phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Am I right? Everyone knows the source of that. And the most important thing I learned when I was in jail was that that's kind of backwards. It, we think of that as progression, right? Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, right? If you're not, if you're not breathing, it's kind of hard to you know, enjoy your liberty, obviously. So maybe that part's in the right order. But liberty in the pursuit of happiness, does being free make you happy? Is happiness something that you can go and chase down and beat over the head with a club and drag back to your cave to enjoy forever and ever? No. It's backwards. And I think a lot of people in this movement would benefit from a couple months in solitary confinement <laughs> to have such a similar epiphany. Because that's really what it was for me. And this is a, this is a really important, although you know, minor part of the book that I just wrote, is that happiness causes liberty. Think about that for a second. Now go get arrested and come back in a few months and tell me what you learned. But if you, if you really think about it, happiness is a choice. Your state of mind is a choice. What keeps us from being unhappy is not external impositions of tyranny or, or, or the, the lack thereof that allows you to, 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 to flourish economically or, or, or in, in whatever other way you want to describe it. But it is the emotional slavery that we choose for ourselves at a much deeper level that truly determines whether or not we are going to be happy. Because it's a choice. That's all it is. And you want to say, well, well, Adam, it's not that easy. No, that's the best part. <laughs> it really is. It really is. It's all it comes down to. And, and when, you, when you realize that and you embrace it, you might also realize that it's not automatic. You do have to make a conscious choice. But your state of mind is always your choice. You will never control what the world throws at you. And should we even live to see the day of a stateless, voluntary, absolutely free society? It doesn't free you from the emotional slavery of all the past misdeeds of human experience, your own upbringing, or everything that's been imposed on you, or everybody would like to scare you in order to manipulate you. And this is a big part of what government is based on, right? To, to intimidate you into submission. And we welcome it. Not we, obviously, but you know, as a present company excluded, I would hope. But as a society, and we know this in the sense that government is a product of the paradigm, right? De Tocqueville got it right. In a democracy, people will get the government they deserve. That's really true about any form of government. And we impose this on ourselves. We allow ourselves to be, to be beat down, to be frightened, and to, to be intimidated. I mean, even as, as libertarians or, or whatever you want to describe yourself as, how many people in our movement do you see going, well, I figured out how evil the government is and now I'm angry and miserable and I'm going to be until there's no government or until we fix this thing. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but if that's what the truth does for you, you're doing it wrong.
the truth is supposed to set you free. And if you embrace this attitude, this approach to the world of, of libertarianism, and you allow yourself to remain an emotional cripple, a slave to all of the influences around you, that you are, you are incapable of determining your own outlook, your own perspective, your own point of view, What's the point of being free? Really? It's not going to make your life any better to get people to leave you alone if you can't have that basic respect for your own inner beauty of the human will. And one of the things I learned from my time in Fallujah, you know, I was in Iraq for seven months with the Marines in 2004, is that the universality of the human experience. And I saw fellow Marines and, and soldiers engaging in the kind of dehumanization of the enemy that is essential for war. You know? And I don't mean just the, the casual racism of you know, Haji, which is obviously, for those of you who know, a term of respect that was turned into a term of disrespect or towel head or, or anything like that. But, Oh my God, these people don't know how to stand in line. What's wrong with them? You know, they, they can't you know, send their kids to college. Well, it's because they're worried about their kids surviving. And there's, there's something, you know, I, I would barely even describe myself as a spiritual person, but there's something truly divine about the human will. And the most important thing we can do to truly liberate ourselves is embrace and respect that. And it is the failure to do so that is why government exists, that is why statism flourishes, that is why they are able to get away with the racket that we see around us every day. And it's not enough to figure out the problem, and it's not enough to raise awareness, and it's not enough to speak out. And especially now, in this day and age, when we see that all of the information that you have that may have motivated you to be here is at the fingertips of everybody who's not here, what we really have to do, if we want people to join us and to be a part of this, is to show people how embracing whatever this philosophy is to you makes your life better. And that was the most important thing that I, I learned in jail, aside from some tricks about, you know, how to use commissary food to trade for favors and make special jailhouse recipes and how to, uh, how to work out without equipment and all the other fun things that you learn in that situation. But a lot of people are familiar with my activism and taking a shotgun out in Freedom Plaza on Independence Day was certainly a, a risky act of civil disobedience. And overall, I, I think it was an incredible success. We reached millions of people with this message. We definitely provided a, a, a shocking lesson for a lot of people who didn't realize that gun control was violence, that gun control isn't about guns, it's about control, and that self-defense is a fundamental civil right. And I think we were able to reach a lot of people because they're, they're ready for this, they want to hear this. But what really motivates me is a passion for justice. And freedom is a very simple concept. And a lot of people who say, well, we want freedom, we want more freedom, we never stop to really define it. And getting to the understanding of the terms that we're talking about is so essential. We throw things around, especially in politics, where propaganda redefines things all the time for us without us getting any say in it. And I'm sure you all know, as activists, you go and talk to people on the street and you throw words around and it's, it's, it's like you're speaking a different language, because you are. And oftentimes when they're dealing with, with the, the, the status quo or they're coming from a mainstream perspective, it's really hard to understand, but freedom is a very, very simple concept. 
very, very simple. You own yourself as a free, beautiful, independent human being. And therefore, it is morally wrong to ever initiate force, fraud, or coercion against a fellow human being. This is an absolute moral principle that is ingrained in our nature as, as human beings. And there's no compromise. And if you, if you believe that there is a concept of justice based on that principle of freedom, and when you come out and, and argue for liberty, if you come out with compromise and you say, well, we're going to accept a little bit of government here or there. We're going to accept that there is going to be some ruling authority that is going to use coercion over us. We're going to accept some form of, I guess the, uh, the popular term is, is minarchism, right? You're still advocating for injustice. And if you're driven... If you're driven by the same passion for justice that motivates me in my activism, there's no compromise. And as soon as you give up your principles, you've given up any opportunity you ever had to win someone over based on their passions. And if you're saying, you know what, there's injustice in the world, there's tyranny in America, there is a destructive government that is out of control, and we want less than justice. <laughs> You're not fighting for justice. And it's really simple. Either you believe in it or you don't. But that's what motivates me, and I hope that is what motivates people here. And I hope that these principles and the lessons that I've learned over the course of my activism can be of some use to this movement and people can take some inspiration for it and I'm very, very honored to see that so many people have and I just want to close by thanking everybody who supported me while I was locked up, the thousands of people who wrote me letters, who donated to my legal defense fund, everybody who wrote to the judge and sent letters and, and left voicemails and everything like that. And for everybody who else make what I do possible, I am eternally grateful. And I, I just, I, I, standing here today, when I, I could be, uh, you know, back in a in an orange suit, is is still quite a shock. It's still sinking in. You know, just yesterday to find out for sure. And I, I just want to share one one little quote from the pre-sentencing report. Did, did anybody see that? I, I posted that online the other day. Yeah. All right, there's, there's, a, there's a, a bureaucrat somewhere in, in, in the bowels of the system who writes these reports about people who go before the judge for sentencing. And, oh my gosh, it was so fun reading mine. It was like, oh, so this is what they really think. He callously goes around engaging in political demonstrations without giving it a second thought. <laughs> yeah, they are right. He is a high risk for recidivism <laughs> because he engages in civil disobedience and he feels that protesting is his right. <laughs> well, it's true to an extent, but I know that protesting is my right, and I do what I do because I know it is everyone's right. Thank you very much.